Welcome to season three of the audio and video podcast, The Health Pulse. I'm your new host, Alex Maersperger, and in this season, we are celebrating the health heroes, making a difference in life sciences and healthcare around the world. We have some terrific guests lined up, and I can't wait for the conversations to come and for the optimistic view that together we can create a healthier future. Today, we get to celebrate and welcome Dr. Sean Cozen, Chief Executive Officer of ASCO's Cancer Link, a board certified oncologist, physician scientist, and data science expert. Welcome, Dr. Cozen. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be here. Uh, so there's a quote that uh, is used to refer to someone a lot of times that they've done a little bit of a lot. And I think in your case, we can amend the quote to someone who's done a lot, a bit of a lot. Uh, you've founded companies, including Hello Health. You've held executive roles across government agencies like the FDA, where you were the founding executive director of their first data science and technology incubator. You've worked for the largest private companies focused on cancer care as previous global head of data strategy and data science innovation at Janssen R&D. So why cancer link sort of what throughout this journey has led you to the, the cancer link now? And is there something unique to this opportunity that, that drew you in? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. You know, I, I think cancer link occupies a very, uh, special place at, uh, the convergence point of technology. Uh, biomedical research and healthcare delivery, uh, areas that we've historically viewed as being uh, distinct entities, uh, as opposed to, say, a single vector of opportunity focused on improving human health and reducing the burden of diseases on society. Uh, in the past century, the biomedical enterprise and the practice of medicine uh, have been largely focused uh, on, on super specialization. Um, and lately, uh, we've been, in fact, lamenting about the symptoms of this fragmentation as working in silos and uh, the lack of adequate cross-functional uh, collaboration. Uh, Cancelling, to me, represents an opportunity to break the silos, uh, bringing medicine, engineering and biomedical research uh, together in a uh, bottom-up manner. Uh, and starting with the two most critical uh, players uh, in the ecosystem, uh, patients and providers. Uh, so um, that was one of the most attractive features of CancerLink. And my vision for the uh, uh, organization is essentially centered on harnessing uh, the latest innovations in technology and data science to empower patients and oncologists with the right tools to advance cancer care quality and research including therapeutic development in an integrated, multidisciplinary fashion. You, you talked about the lamenting portion, and I think there's a, a large portion of society, which you, you touched on, that is recognizing some of those silos and some of that difficulty or barriers to access or whatever it may be that we, we all are well-versed, I think, in the challenges of healthcare. And I think from a societal perspective, we see a lot of that curing cancer versus treating cancer. And so serious question, because I think we've seen the conspiracy side throughout the pandemic. Uh, and we've certainly also seen some bad actors, uh, maybe profiting off of the human suffering side. So there's a lot of that societal perception money is made off of sick people and not healthy ones. Can you speak to that the convergence of your mission at cancer link on the, the curing and treating of cancer? Uh, sure, you know, I think uh, Alex conspiratorial uh, thinking has always been um, uh, at the fringes of the fabric of society. I guess the only difference uh, today is that is these uh, conspiratorial voices have been amplified, uh, uh, primarily uh, with uh, the use of social media. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, worth paying too much attention to these uh, conspiratorial tendencies about profiting off uh, sick patients. Uh, you know, in a free market economy like we have in the US and much of the West, if someone found a cure for cancer uh, or any other diseases, for, for that matter, you can bet private investments will flow as they have in the past in support of any disruptive innovation. Um, now, it is true uh, that uh, the prelude for all progress, you know, be it scientific or socioeconomic, is directly challenging status quo thinking. You know, Einstein turned Newtonian physics on his head with, a, with his theory of relativity, which 
you know, we forget at the time was highly controversial in, in the early days as he was formulating his uh, hypotheses. And Arnold Schoenberg uh, rewrote the language of music uh, theory with a lot of criticism and backlash uh, with his 12 uh, tone uh, system of composition. Uh, so I think it's perfectly legitimate um, to question the incentives today we have in our healthcare system. Um, and that's different, I believe, than, than having a conspiratorial frame of mind. And I think if we think about our healthcare system today, it's really inherently designed uh, to treat illness as opposed to uh, prevent disease and, and, and keeping in, individuals uh, uh, healthy. And that's just uh, a, a function of the incentive structures we have in place. And, and, and the fact that uh, in order to do prevention and early detection, uh, we have to have broad access to very expensive tools and technologies. Uh, and I think all players in the ecosystem, from providers to insurers to therapeutic development organizations, are following uh, this incentive structure that's uh, uh, firmly in place today. Uh, and uh, in using oncology as an example, um, you know, we are, uh, it's much easier to uh, treat patients in um, advanced stage disease because that's when uh, the majority of patients with cancer present and develop therapies to treat um, advanced stage disease. Now, the good news is that we're starting to see this paradigm being challenged by technologies like liquid biopsies uh, that I believe are poised to play a critical role, um, not only in cancer prevention uh, and early detection, but also in disease monitoring in the ad advanced stage. I love your optimistic view of cancer prevention and early detection, because we can all agree right now getting cancer is the worst. All of us will be affected by it in some way, shape or form over the course of our lives. Right now, it really matters where you get cancer care. Uh, certain physicians may have more information or better technology. How is CancerLink helping get information to the clinician that's treating you so that maybe in the future where you go doesn't matter as much? Sure, that's a great question. I mean, we always uh, talk about uh, democratizing, you know, access to uh, best available care, and and uh, there are variations in in oncology practice patterns, and uh, I think some of uh, uh, that uh, there are technical solutions uh, uh, where we can bring, for example, uh, decision support tools to the point of care uh, in order to. Uh, optimize decision making in near real time, and that's that's very important uh, to uh, an important consideration because uh, when we think about what oncologists have avail available to them to treat patients, you know, they rely on uh, first and foremost their own clinical judgment and intuitions. Still to this day, clinical judgment and intuition is the primary driver of the majority of uh, clinical decisions. Why? Because um, you know, clinical trials um, don't tell the whole story, um, and there are a variety of different reasons for that. You know, in in oncology, uh, only about five percent of cancer patients have access to uh, clinical trial participation. So the results of clinical trials sometimes tend to be uh, very much confined to the experience of a highly selected patient population. Uh, that may be very different than patients uh, that are being treated in the real world. Uh, so a lot of oncologists cannot get the information they need by examining the results of um, traditional clinical trials. There's a mathematical definition of, of that, which is uh, that a lot of cancer clinical trials lack external validity. And external validity is what we need to be able to extrapolate the results of a study to treating real world patient populations. Uh, so, um, and then the other uh, option that an oncologist has um, would be to ex uh, uh, follow guideline recommendations, which are mostly consensus-based and quite helpful uh, as a, uh, a foundation for treating patients. However, you know, our treatments are becoming more personalized and, you know, it takes a long time nowadays to even update uh, treatment guidelines. Uh, so, our approach at canceling is to collect real-world data that reflects uh, the nuances and the diversity of patients that may not be represented in traditional clinical trials uh, to analyze that data and deliver those insights to oncologists as 
um, algorithmic decision support tools, decision support tools that helps them uh, use the data that we have on our entire um, uh, patient population um, that is connected to CancerLink in order to help oncologists individualize treatment decisions for the end of one in a near real-time fashion. So I'm, I firmly believe the guidelines of the future are going to be algorithms that collect data, analyze data, and then provide near real-time insights uh, to uh, clinicians at the point of care. And I believe that is uh, uh, something that you know, a lot of other technology companies are also in a great position uh, to do in other settings, but also in oncology, uh, because um, there's a lot of data out there and the data currently is uh, uh, mostly supporting the biomedical research enterprise and using the same data assets to bring um, insights to the point of care, I believe uh, uh, can really improve uh, health outcomes, especially in oncology, where things are quite complex, multimodal. And in the past 10 years, we've had um, a lot of new therapies, and it's becoming very challenging for oncologists to um, appropriately, in some cases, connect all the dots uh, and individuals, their treatment decisions. That uh, incredible amount of complexity, like you said, and then there's the intuition versus the guidelines versus the sort of current data that you're you're getting thrown at you now. And so as an individual physician, putting that much time and energy and resources into just the training that goes into being uh, a specialist in, in some of the highly specialized areas, which you talked about, the data sharing, there was a story when I was working as a hospital administrator that was told about two competing hospitals that shared a parking garage. A physician at one of the hospitals invented a new sort of method of doing a certain heart surgery that led to better outcomes. And it was uh, nothing sort of intellectual property based. It was kind of at this stitch you go under instead of over and going under is saving this time and, and uh, improving outcomes. So she went across the street and wanted to share that with the competing hospital saying, hey, if you just go under instead of over, and I'm obviously way oversimplifying, but uh, if you just go under instead of over, you'll, you'll improve the outcomes and your patients will go home healthier and happier and faster. Uh, that competing hospital didn't want to hear it as the story goes of just, hey, we've got our own way of doing things. We're going to keep going over because this is how we do it. This is our maybe intuition um, and our guidelines are, are better than you than yours. Is cancer care data sharing in a similar place now? Is it going to be different in the future? Is it way different than than that story? Are there holdouts? Or when you're getting hit with this new data in presented in the right way, are you saying, okay, we're all in on this? Sure. I think uh, today we're in a much better position than you know your example may suggest, uh, but there's still a lot more work to do. Uh, and again, this goes back to the in incentive structures in place. Uh, you know, for example, in academia, one of the primary metrics for career advancement is a number of publications. Uh, you know, the saying is uh, "publish or perish," as uh, uh, as you know. Uh, naturally, this creates a lot of complexities in letting go of data, and and uh, usually people hold on to their data and, and to try to uh, say squeeze as much as much as possible in terms of the number of publications from the data, and they're just responding to the incentive uh, structures that are in place in academia, uh, in industry. You know, lack of data sharing, uh, I think, is primarily due to. Uh, perceived uh, competitive advantages of of holding the data very close to the chest, and in some cases, in many cases, uh, those perceived uh, uh, ideas may not be real. That you know, there are a lot of pre-competitive uh, opportunities um, when it comes to data sharing that can benefit uh, in industry. But again, uh, industry is also responding to the incentive structures that are in place. Um, now, I think a lot has happened in, in the past five years alone. And the good news is that I think we're moving in, in the right direction. Not long ago, you know, we had folks uh, that were using phrases like uh, data parasites to describe uh, uh, data sharing and, and researchers that were interested in secondary uses of data. And we don't hear those phrases anymore. And I think the majority of incumbents today 
uh, do believe in the merits of data sharing when it comes to advancing um, uh, the needs of patients and the benefits that are associated uh, uh, with uh, using uh, sharing data broadly from a societal perspective. So I think we're in a much better place, but there's a lot more that we need to do in terms of developing um, mechanisms and putting mechanisms into place that accommodate sharing of data broadly, but also in a responsible manner, in a way that it protects uh, patient privacy. And there are tools and technologies like uh, uh, privacy preserving protocols and federated learning models that are addressing the technical end of the equation. And we just have to start to um, demystify a lot of these tools and technologies so folks can start to trust them when it comes to sharing the, uh, of data. Because trust, at the end of the day, is one of the most uh, important components uh, of allowing data to flow freely. You, you touched on this a little bit earlier, and I think it, it plays into that trust of just what or what amount of people with cancer, diagnosed with cancer, have access to clinical trials or are participants in clinical trials. And that 5% number is just a number that, that stands out loud and clear of 95% of people aren't represented in that. And so sometimes we, we don't know what we don't know. Real world data and clinical trials, how precise is precision medicine right now? How much do we know this certain drug affected this person because of the components of the drug versus this affected this person because they don't have a fan at home or air conditioning in their home. And they're constantly breathing bad air and we didn't know that. Uh, how precise is sort of precision medicine right now? Well, uh, we're certainly a lot more precise um, just in the past uh, 30 years in, in oncology and in the past 100 years. Uh, uh, we've become extremely precise. Uh, if you look at the history of medicine, you know, not long ago in, in the mid 1800s, we're still believing that miasma, you know, bad air, yeah. was responsible for most diseases. And when you think about that from a historical uh, perspective, it wasn't that long ago. So we've become much more precise, but focusing uh, on oncology, especially in, in the past, let's say 20 years, uh, we've become incredibly precise with the uh, advances in uh, technologies such as genomic sequencing um, in developing targeted therapies. Uh, as an example, um, there was a, a study that uh, several years ago uh, we did at uh, DFTA where we uh, looked at all the approvals in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and uh, starting with uh, double chemotherapy, which was the only uh, option we had uh, before targeted therapies. So in 2003, uh, looking at the data, um, you know, the number needed to benefit, which means how many patients do you need to treat with chemotherapy for one patient to benefit, the number needed to uh, benefit in non-small cell lung cancer for double chemotherapy was eight. So we, for every eight patients we treated, unfortunately, only one of them benefited. And then... Um, uh, we uh, looked at targeted therapies and immune checkpoint inhibitors for patients that have the appropriate biomarkers, in this case, pdl one positivity. The number needed to benefit uh, is about two. And that's remarkable progress. That's precision right. uh, uh, therapy and precision drug development. But even in drug development, if you think about it now, number needed to treat of two means that still half the patients are not driving optimal benefit. So that's a residual imprecision we have in therapeutic development, and we're making very rapid advances with um, next generation diagnostic assays, including uh, liquid biopsies and deep uh, genomic sequencing technologies. Uh, and also uh, with uh, the convergence of uh, advanced analytical methods like AI and machine learning, we're going to be able to extract a lot more insight from this massive amount of data we're generating in the context of therapeutic development. Now, precision in healthcare delivery is a completely different story. Unfortunately, precision in healthcare delivery is lagging behind. You know, the numbers that I told you with number needed to benefit uh, were derived from a study we did at the FDA using registrational studies that are uh, you know, pristine data, very uh, um, you know, expensive studies that are highly controlled, and they are very different than treating patients in the real world. So 
uh, when it comes to treating patients in the real world, and we already touched on some of that because of the complexities in uh, making these treatment decisions at the point of care, precision in, in care delivery has been lagging behind. And there's evidence that in fact supports that. Uh, if we look at uh, a number of studies that have been done in the past few years using real world data, it's very clear that the out, uh, uh, patient outcomes in the real world uh, are inferior to those observed in clinical trials. There are several reasons for that, but uh, one of uh, the primary reasons I believe is this lack of precision um, in care delivery and being able to tailor treatment decisions to the individual needs of patients in the real world. I love the historical perspective that you brought in because I think looking at that sort of timeline view of the the way that we've introduced medication or the way that we've introduced theories like bad air and uh, disproved some and proved others, uh, we're still in very early stages where you said it's, it's just not that long ago, truly. That And so I love that perspective around precision medicine is sometimes as an industry, we can beat ourselves up a little bit in healthcare and life science that uh, we're, we're not as good as we want to be, but to see how far we've come, how quickly. And I love your the optimist take of what will happen, sort of that exponential growth from there, that precision medicine has come a long, long way. And we're probably going to come a long, long way a little bit even faster than it took us to get to this point. I love that take. Uh, you said at, about regulatory science, uh, you said in a Stanford Precision Health Conference uh, talk several years ago, I think it was back in 2012, you had said that you you didn't know what regulatory science meant then um, and that you may have known what it meant by 2017 in a, a follow-up talk. So you said at the time that it was about where we are now and where we should be. And so you defined regulatory science as translational research over the past 10 years or so. So you've given the, the same same answer about regulatory science and not sort of fully understanding, having that grasp of, of what it is, uh, how to translate what it is you do to the world. Is that st still how you view the needs and opportunities in regulatory science? So I'm, I'm still uh, learning, you know, about the definition of uh, regulatory science, Alex. And, you know, I think translational science is the still the best definition that I can come up with. Uh, because uh, a, a, uh, you can regulate systems um, by um, making policy decisions and, and I think, uh, rate oversight in terms of enforcement of uh, the law of the land is, is one mechanism. But as we know in drug development and uh, what, for example, the FDA does, um, you know, it's not, it's never black and white, you know, we're always, you know, in the gray area. And the best way to address these uh, very complex um, challenges that we have in, in the regulatory space is by uh, being able to translate the latest advances in technology uh, to um, mechanisms where uh, we can facilitate uh, the safe and effective delivery of these tools and technologies uh, into the point of care. And, and it's the translation of uh, the technologies we, we have and the mechanisms uh, by which we can bring these tools and technologies safely to the point of care that I believe uh, is uh, in, uh, in the domain of regulatory science. And that means that regulatory agencies uh, have to take a very proactive posture uh, in, in terms of uh, advancing their mission, which is to promote and protect uh, public health. And that uh, uh, requires a, a collaborative mindset where you know, there's a little bit of skin in the game that as, a, as an agency that is really focused on not giving thumbs up or thumbs down to uh, drugs, devices, or biologics, but really the mission is to advance uh, public health, uh, there, there are many opportunities, collaborative opportunities embedded within that uh, um, directive and that mandate uh, that may involve doing uh, you know, research on the ground and helping de-risk some of these tools and technologies with innovators uh, in order to, again, accommodate 
the safe and effective delivery of these solutions uh, to the point of care and, and to society. So I think it's still translational science. Um, and I believe as part of that, it's very important to have access to uh, data, to uh, appropriate data sets, and also have a, uh, an outward looking collaborative mindset that's focused on the, the delivery of innovations and accommodating the delivery of innovations uh, to individuals and society in, in the most uh, uh, agile um, and efficient manner while protecting patient safety. What's the best optimistic take you have for the, the future of cancer care? Are you, uh, I think we see just a lot of negativity in the press and in the news, and I'm sure day to day there's some frustrating moments of, hey, I wish we were able to do some of the basics better. I wish we were able to do some of the, the really exciting stuff. What's the thing that most excites you about the future of cancer care? You know, I think um, we are becoming a lot more precise in uh, cancer drug development. And that precision is starting to have an impact on how we take care of patients. Um, and I think uh, the convergence of technology and data science uh, with how we develop therapies and deliver um, drugs at the point of care is gonna, going to have a massive impact on uh, both ends of the equation, um, cancer research and also cancer care uh, delivery. Now, there are fundamental structural problems that we need to address, but I think uh, if we just look at uh, the amount of investments uh, that have mo moved into health technology in the past five years alone, uh, it will, with no doubt, have a major impact on, on how we treat patients, on how we develop new drugs. And I firmly believe what we do in the next uh, 10 years is going to set the tone in uh, cancer uh, care delivery and research for the next 50 uh, years, if not longer. So we're at an inflection point today where we have a, uh, an amazing array of tools uh, that can empower us in how we not only develop drugs, but how we treat patients. And if we're able to um, address some of the uh, fundamental organizational barriers that um, are uh, preventing us to uh, best optimize the use of these new tools and technologies, um, I think we are going to be able to uh, say that in 10 years, um, we have addressed uh, some of the most critical needs uh, of, of patients with cancer. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're going to cure all cancers, but I think uh, cancer is uh, going to be a chronic disease. And in some cases it is today, but I think uh, there's still a lot of patients that are left behind that in 10 years, uh, if we do things right and if the current trends continue, we're going to be in a completely a new domain. Really appreciate that perspective. There's, you, you had said we're at an inflection point of sort of exponential growth of what comes next. And I love that throughout this conversation, you've been able to paint sort of the historical aspects of where we were and how far we've come. And in, in a lot of ways and how short of a time we've come so far, uh, but then provide that really beautiful roadmap for the uh, the future that we can we can really have data to the end of one uh, to your clinician who's treating you right in front of you that says here's who you are and here's the best drugs that are going to treat you here's the best uh, sort of wraparound life services that will help you um, and I really appreciate your perspective I know that you have infinite demands on your time so we, we thank you so much Dr. Kozen for spending a little bit of time with us here today Thank you, Alex. Uh, this was a great conversation. Thank you for having me. And to our, our listeners and viewers, there's also infinite demands on your time. We are so appreciative for listening and participating. We can't wait to continue creating a healthier future with you. Uh, there are so many real challenges in the world. We hope that wherever you are, there are ways to find and be the good around you. Uh, we welcome you to the conversation at our email address, thehealthpulsepodcast at sas.com and here in the comments on YouTube.